Crazy Johnson is one of the foremost poets now and really performing in the UK. And it's really impossible to overstate his influence on multiple generations of poets and artists and musicians and activists over the past 40 years. Since the release of his first book in 1974 and his debut album in 1978, Johnson has consistently forged his own utterly committed style. If he's been accepted by the establishment and the fact that he's won so many awards, honorary fellowships, degrees and distinctions, um, suggest that he has, um, his poetry is even now part, taught as part of the national curriculum, it's not because he's watered down his message or softened his style for the sake of the normally conservative British poetry heritage industry. As he put it, I have never ever sought validation from the arbiters of British poetic taste. Rather, his work has burned a path for himself and many other writers straight through that establishment. In the process, he has developed an audience and shown us how developing an audience is a political rather than a necessarily commercial act. Reflecting on a lifetime of poetic activism, he once said, I was coming from a position of cultural autonomy. I did my own thing, built my own audience, and established my own base. My audience was ordinary people. Like Phillips, Johnson's poetry tells a story never told. As the original dub or reggae poet, Johnson often performs with musicians, including the Dennis Bobble dub band, and he teaches us to hear this music as the music of blood black reared. He's long challenged the racist associations embedded in so-called standard English, and he's very, really brilliant at antagonizing the sun and the spectator in this regard. He was one of the first poets to speak out about the experiences of young black British people in the post-Windrush generation, using poetry as what he called a cultural weapon in the struggle against police brutality, racism, colonialism, and in service of the class struggle. I didn't believe that at that time a black poet could have the luxury of art for art's sake. It had to be in the service of the struggle, he said. His poetic activism also extends to work as a journalist, record producer, founder of the LKJ record label, and co-founder of the George Padmore Institute. He's developed important radio programs, uh, markets for radical and third world books, he's led Black Panther poetry workshops, and been a, an instrumental part of numerous radical political collectives. He says about his early work that there wasn't anyone else writing about the black experience in Britain in the kind of language I was using and from the aesthetic I was coming from. These were poems to read at rallies and demonstrations and cultural gatherings of a political nature. They were also so widely admired that in 2002 his poems were published as a Penguin Modern Classic. But however established they have become, these are still poems to be read at rallies and demonstrations, poems which get your blood up and make you laugh and sing and fight. Please welcome Lenton Crazy Johnson. Good evening. <clears throat> I hope um, my voice holds out because um, for the last six weeks I've been having problems with my, with my vocal cords. Um, funny enough, I haven't got a sore throat, it's just that I tend to go worse um, from time to time, so um, you have to bear with me in case that happens. I'm gonna, it's, kind of, it's getting kind of late, so I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do a poem, um, An elegy, a poem, a love poem, a poem about language, and then we'll see how we get on after that. This is um, a poem I wrote for a sister poet um, who died in 1996. Her name was Maya Ayim also known as Maya Pitts. She was German. <clears> her <throat> father was a German, uh, a Ghanaian, a Ghanaian medical student. And uh, her mother was German. And she was raised by German foster parents. She published a collection of poems called uh, Blues in 
black and white and co-edited a book of essays called Showing Our Colors <clears throat> about our experiences as a mixed race woman growing up in Germany. She became involved in the Afro-German movement based in Berlin and the women's movement and in 1996 she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and she had a nervous breakdown and went to a high-rise building and jumped from the 13th floor. Reggae Femai Ayim. It weird our life with death can conspire. To shatter the art's most fragile desire. Oh, history and biography can plot against you and them angst and them anomie gang upon you. Afro-German warrior woman from Hamburg via Bremen then finally Berlin. It was in the dazzling atmosphere at the Black Radical Book Fair that my psyche, sweet sister, bright eyed like hope, like a young antelope who could have cope. With the daily, the flowing of the spirit, with the everyday erosion of the soul. Two passing clouds, you and I, in the desert of the sky, exchanging vapor. But in the commerce of the art, was it fair trade in regret, in love and laughter? Me never knew, me couldn't tell, me should have said, say. Through all the learning, the teaching, resisting and assisting, the loving, the giving, organizing and defying, that the Kaiser of darkness did capture the heart. That the last time we see you would be the last time we see you. That he was free, falling, screaming, 13 stanzas down, your final poem in blood upon the ground. That so sudden, that so soon he would have fly out on a one way ticket to Ghana, go and catch up with your past amongst your ancestors. We give thanks for the life you share with me. We give thanks for the light you shine upon me. We give thanks for the love you show upon me. We give thanks for your memory. This is a, a love poem called Hurricane Blues. Long time lover. My mind run upon you all the while and remember how first time the two we come in it did seem like two shallow little snake in stream. Marching mapless, hapless a gala through the rugged landscape of the hard song. And I saw we did a go on so till that fateful day. After the passion of the hurricane, further than imagination or dream, we find ourselves laid down upon the same bedrock, flowing now together as one stream. Riding sublime through love, lavish terrain, lush and green and bright after the rain, shimmering with glittering eyes, Glowing in the clear at the smiling sun. Long time lover, me feel blue for true when me think about you. Blue like the sky, lingering promise of rain in the leaking light in the hush of an evening twilight. When me remember how first time. The tour we come in, it did seem 
like a long, long river that is wide and deep. Sometime we was silent like the language of Rockstone. Sometime we would have sing a river song as we are wide and along. Sometime we just cool and calm under plenty shady tree. Sometimes soft the lapping bamboo root as them swing and sway. Sometimes cascading carefree down a steep gully bank. Sometimes turbulent in temperament, the flood we bank. What whether ebb or flow, through rain, through drought, we never stray far from love, rigid road. Old time sweetheart, up to now we still can't understand how we get back down in a so much silt and sand, rock, stone, debris, log jam. So tell we had was to flow up the separate part. Now traversing the territory in a love landscape, running from the pollution of a contrite heart, me long for the marvelous miracle of hurricane to carry me go a meeting stream again, lamenting my salted feet, surmising said, it's too late. A poem about language. Years, some years ago when um, the term ethnic cleansing gained currency, I found this term to be very disturbing and I couldn't understand why it had gained currency because the term ethnic cleansing for me um, presupposes the whole idea, you know, the whole notion of ethnic pollution. And once one begins to think uh, uh, along those lines, you end up with fascism and Nazism and Holocaust and all kinds of barbarism. We need to be careful about how we use language in my view because we not only negotiate our everyday reality through language, more importantly, we define our humanity through language. Ethnic cleans cleansing for me is a term that um, it's about the dehumanization of language and the language of dehumanization. So this poem, that is what inspired this poem called New World Order. The killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatila must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia must be sanitary workers. In a new world order. Like a dirty old bandage upon the festering face of humanity, the old order unravel and reveal, old scar just a broke out, broke out in a new soul. Primeval wound, a time on heal, and in the ancient currency of blood, tribal tyrants a settle old score. The killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatila must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia must be sanitary workers. In other new world order. And is the same old Cain and Abel syndrome far more ancient than the fall of Rome? But in the new world order of atrocity, is a brand new language of barbarity. Mass murder normalized, pogrom rationalized, genocide sanitized, and the ancient cleansing. No name ethnic cleansing. And so the killers of Kigali must be sanitary workers. The butchers of Butari must be sanitary workers. The savages of Chatila must be sanitary workers. The beasts of Bosnia must be sanitary workers. Prapram, pram, in other new word order. Back during the 1980s and 90s, <coughs> we had a book fair, an international book fair of radical black and 
Third World Books, which was organized by New Beacon Books, uh, Bogle Overture Publications, and the Race Today Collective. The book fair ran between 1982 and 1995. Accompanying the book fair were forums where we had platforms to discuss burning topics of the time. One of the topics we discussed was the revolution in new, in new technology and how that was impacting on the way people worked, the way people communicated and created. And out of these discussions amongst people like the trade unionist um, Dave, Dave Fikirk, um, who worked for the uh, Miners Union, and people like John LaRose, the director of the book fair, and others. Um, out of those discussions came the idea that the revolution in new technology is not necessarily a bad thing because it could provide the basis for guaranteeing full employment in modern, advanced economies um, because of the increased productive capacity and the use of artificial intelligence and so on. But that could only happen if we were able to have the shorter working day, the shorter working week, the shorter working life, with more time for cultural creativity and leisure. Um, and that inspired me to write this poem called More Time. We're marching out the world towards the new century, armed um, with the new technology. We're getting more and more productivity. Some set things looking up for prosperity. But if everyone gonna get a share this time, whole mentality must get left behind. We want the shorter working day, give me the shorter working week. Longer holiday, we need decent pay. More time for leisure, more time for pleasure, more time for edification, more time for recreation, more time for contemplate, more time for ruminate, more time for relate, more time. We need more time. Give me more time. A full time them abolish unemployment and revolutionize labor deployment. A full time them banish overtime. Make everybody get a work this time. We need a higher quality of liberty. We need it no one for everybody. We want the shorter work in here. Give with the shorter work in life. More time for the husband, more time for the wife. More time for the children, more time for a friend, more time for meditate, more time for create, more time for living, more time for life, more time. We need more time, give it more time. I don't think I have much more time, so I'm just going to <laughs> And um, this is um, a poem um, which I contributed to the ongoing campaign which has been been uh, fought for some time now against the frightening incidents of not just deaths in custody but black deaths at the hands of the police. It's really a poem about the culture of impunity within the metropolitan police force and other police forces up and down the country. It's called License to Kill. It's a conversation between two workers. Sometimes I think the poor worker crazy. The way Christine would have gone jokey jokey. Then the next time now, I know nonsense stands. The way she wind up the place last Christmas dance. The way she love to talk about conspiracy. Me and Christine, you know, the canteen attack about the death of black people in a custard. How oh, not a cat make me out, nor no damn dog bark. How oh, nobody high up in a society can offer explanation, no remedy. When Christine lick up her brow like she a row, she have a row. Screw up her face like she a trace, she have a trace. Here are now. 
You think, you think I just MI5 and James Bond and police and soldier over North Island one? When it comes to black people, Winston, some police in England got license to kill. Well, nothing Christine said surprised me still. But hear me now. What do you mean, Christine? I will tell you that. I must see one idiot. You can't prove that. I will tell me if you go say that. Christine kissed her teeth, then she cut me with her eye, and she said, You want proof? You can't ask Clinton McCurbin about him asphyxiation. And you can't ask Joy Gordon about her suffocation. You can't ask Colin Roach if he really shoot himself. And you can't ask Vincent Graham if I even stab himself. But you can ask the commissioner about the license to kill. Ask Sir Paul Condon about the license to kill. You can't ask the Douglas them about the new style baton. And you can't ask Tony Hassan about him dead by neglect. You can't ask Marlon Downs if him have any regret. And you can't ask Elder Mal about the mystery I'm dead. But you can ask the Barbara about the license to kill. Ask the DPP about the license to kill. You can ask Ibrahim about the CSGS attack. You can ask Mrs. Jarrett how she get her heart attack. You can ask Oliver Price about the grip around him neck. And you can ask Steve Boyce about him death by neglect. But you can ask the PCA about the license to kill. Ask the ACPO about the license to kill. If you ask Maggie Thatcher, book the license to kill. And you can ask John Major, book the license to kill. If you ask Michael Howard, book the license to kill. And you can ask Jack Straw, book the rule of law. If you ask Tony Beer, if he is aware or care, book the license to kill that plenty police feel them got. Sometimes I think the co work are crazy. The way Christine would have gone jokey jokey. And the next time now, I know nonsense stands. The way she wind down the place last Christmas dance. The way she love to talk about conspiracy.